and I am not going to waste your time and give you the 14 points I have on why gossip is wrong. We'll save that for another day. Maybe I'll teach it on Sunday night when the room is full of 20-year-olds who don't know any better. But I respect you guys, and I respect what God is doing in your life. And I'm going to take it from a completely different perspective. Story goes, a pastor was sitting in the back pew waiting for his opportunity to preach a Christmas message. And he leans over to a little old lady sitting beside him and says, Mary's pregnant. He got up and preached, and by the end of that week, the whole church was wanting to know who this Mary was and why was she having a kid out of wedlock. It was Advent. Mary's pregnant. Get the joke? Yes. But it's not a joke, because that is how we are as people. Proverbs says, I'll give you a couple things out of this. Proverbs says that. In Proverbs 18.8, that the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's most inner parts. Think about the most juicy steak that you've ever had. And I had one at a, what was the, what was the wedding? Oh, Joy? Wedding oh, Pens, Pens, Pens uh, Ale House or whatever it was. I, I was, anyway, we went, we were, I did a <laughs> wedding up, way up north a few weeks ago and they had steak for the, the, the wedding party, and it was the most tender, juicy thing I ever put down my mouth. And when I was thinking about the tender morsels Proverbs talking about there, I was thinking about that. They didn't even need the A1 sauce. It was that good. Um, my buddy Charles Kimball, one of my favorite writers, uh, describes gossip this way. It says this, Who am I? I have no respect for justice. I maim without killing. I break hearts and ruin lives. I am cruel and malicious and gather strength with age. The more I am quoted, the more I am believed. I flourish at every level of society. My victims are helpless. They cannot protect themselves against me because I have no name and no face. To track me down is impossible. The harder you try, the more elusive I become. Nobody's friend. Once I tarnish a reputation, it is never the same. I topple governments, ruin marriages, I destroy careers, cause heartache, and sleepless nights. I wreck churches and separate Christians. I spawn suspicion, uh, generate grief, and make innocent people cry on their pillows. My name even hisses. I am gossip. The series that we're in is talking about friendships. We've been talking about friendships and how to talk to each other throughout the whole series. If you go to the Foundry Church TV on YouTube if you want to catch up with all that. Um, we lack intestinal fortitude as Christians in most churches today. We don't have the motto a motto attitude. Uh, one of my favorite TV shows is Blue Bloods. Uh, it's sort of Duck Dynasty that's Irish Catholic, you know? They do eat together, they do pray around a table, which I do like. Um, but there's a brotherhood. One night, one of the episodes, Danny and Jamie were at a bar after a long day, and they were dealing with stuff. And because they were both police officers and both, both, both sons of the police commissioner, they were getting guff for being Reagans, you know? Family name. Some other cops came up and started giving them a hard time. And they were having an honest discussion about the issues with these other police officers. And then one of the officers took the issue and made it personal. He goes, you're a Reagan, and that's why you feel that way. They looked at each other, and the younger one said, sir, bro, let me buy you a beverage, and you need to leave. Because I'm standing between you and my brother right now. And my brother doesn't take kindly for how you talk about our family. We don't have that in the church anymore. We don't have that type of intestinal fortitude when somebody comes up to you in, in church or at a function and says, did you hear about so-and-so? When, think, you're, you're all mature folks, okay? You all have life experiences. 
when was the last time you heard somebody talking smack about another believer in Christ? And what did you do about it? Did you correct them? Did you stop them in their tracks and say, no, 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 no. You're not talking about my brother in Christ that way. You see, unless we police the room, unless we teach the younger how to treat each other, there's going to be gossip. There's going to be stories floating around about people. There are going to be issues that are going around in the body of Christ that are just going to be divisive and pull people apart. Some verses. Instead of preaching at you that it comes out of the pits of hell and everything else that I found in Scripture, I'm just going to give you some verses. Back up here. I won't give you all 72. In Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. If you hear someone saying the wrong thing about somebody, you should cut them off at their knees in love. I'm not giving you permission to walk around and give slap. This is, an, this is not a... Um, a Ukrainian church. My daughter, who, who used to play with the, the Russian Ukrainian orchestra, she was always amazed that the, all the older babushkas would walk around and the young girls were talking out of line, would gift slap them upside the head, literally lay hands on them at church and say, no, 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 we don't talk like that around here. Now, I'm not advocating that our older women walk around and gift slap the younger ones, okay? However, the, you might sometimes want to do that with your husband. You know, I'm just trying to say, the fact is that if we police the room, if we truly love each other, we have to defend each other. If we have no honor amongst ourselves, listen, the Bible says in John, John, 1 John and also in the book of John, by our love for one another, the world would be thirsty, the world would be hungry, the world will look at us and say, I want that. But if they see the same, if I can use the phrase, They'll go proper attitude that the TV show pro propagates about who we are in Delaware County, then guess what? They won't want our Jesus. They won't want to hang out with you. Give me another verse. And by the way, if you'd like to chime in along the way, this is an open service today. I know I work without a net around here. I give you guys permission to talk. But we, we, we got to work together. You know, we, we, us older folks are the ones who are responsible for passing the torch. Okay. Boy, I'll find out how you close something. And, and uh, Proverbs 26, 28 says, A perverse man spreads strife. A slanderer separates intimate friends. It's Titus 3, 2, to malign, to malign one another, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Uh, Exodus 23, 1, you should not bear a false report. Do not join your hand with a wicked man and be malicious, be a malicious witness. James 4, 11, do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges a brother speaks against the law and the judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. Turn with me to... Uh, Matthew 18. I'm not going to keep you long. I want to talk about Matthew 18 because I really think that's the crux of the matter. We need to completely understand we need to completely understand how do we treat with one another? How do we, how do we deal with being wrong? I love Matthew 18 because it's talking about pride, it's talking about boastfulness, it's talking about, and I believe gossip comes from all those things. It starts out in, in verse 1, in the first few verses, where the brotherhood is talking about who's the greatest in the kingdom. Who's going to sit on the right hand of Jesus in heaven? Well, there's an opportunity for the kingdom of God to get smacked down real quick by, the, by Father and Father God. And what does Jesus do? As these knuckleheads, his disciples, who, by the way, 
eventually do figure it out and become warriors for Jesus. While they're arguing amongst themselves about who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus goes, fi goes finds a five-year-old, somebody's grandkid, and puts him on his lap and says, let me tell you who the greatest in the kingdom of the heaven is. Someone who's like this little child, who has this childlike faith. Now we'll drop down with me to verse 15. And I'm going to read verse 15, and I want us to talk about verse 15 onward. If another believer sins against you, talks gossip, says something mean, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you've won that person back. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again, so that everything that you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. That does not mean you start spreading rumors and talking about the person with everybody that you know who happens to be sitting in a pew or a chair with a cup of Starbucks. It means you go to the elders and say, okay, I tried dealing with, with it personally. I tried dealing it with my friends. I now need someone of a higher authority to step in because this causes disunity. If he or she won't accept the church's decision, Treat that person as a pagan or as a corrupt tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this, if two or three of you agree on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. Where two or three gather together, my followers, I am amongst them. I'm a pastor. According to church law in America, I'm not supposed to have feelings. I'm supposed to have alligator skin. I'm supposed to be the tef Teflon priest, you know, where nothing sticks to me, no Velcro allowed, you know. You know, sticks and stones will break your bones and names will always hurt you. But it doesn't matter, you're a pastor, you shouldn't care. You're supposed to be above all that. It doesn't work that way. I have a heart. It pumps. I have a sin nature just like anybody else. Family. I know I have one other pastor in the room who will probably relatively admit to me that there have been times that you cringed over the fact that, dear Lord, what has the church done to my kids? Being a father of, of, of children is not always, and a pastor has not only always been conducive to their spiritual growth, because they've been hurt, hurt and maimed along the way. It's just my perspective. But you see, here's the problem. I'm required, just like you're required, to operate in forgiveness. If someone says something about you, and I, I'm going to give you a personal example without names. I had somebody call me out as a dad and told me that I was a horrible parent. And the reason my kids were having this problem or that problem was because of me. It broke my heart. I, I cried. But I want you to know that I didn't deal with it. You know? I sat back and said, I'll let it go. It was said once, once again, hurt even more. Person did some very bad advice to one of my kids. Hurt even more when my kid followed the advice. And here's the problem. It wiped me out emotionally for seven months. And you know what I finally did? I approached the person without naming names, without dealing with even naming what went down. I said, you said something to me that really hurt me. It crushed my spirit. I want you to know I love you and I forgive you. We talked for a moment or two. Both of us cried. And we forgave each other and we walked forward. See, 
If I had done that when the moment happened the first time, I would have saved myself good six and a half months of heartache. It's a personal example of Matthew 18. I didn't deal with it the way I should have. And here's the thing, we have a lot of folks that have gotten hurt. Listen, we there is no perfect church. There are no perfect Christians. There are always going to be people that will, because we have a sin nature, we're going to say stupid things. We're in an election year, which means it's going to be magnified a hundred times even worse. We've actually lost a couple church members because I said, not this year, not on my watch. I want you to know where I am politically. I am a conservative. However, we have libertarians in this church. We have Democrats in this church. We have Republicans in this church. And we all love Jesus. And it's not about who you think is the best candidate, that, you, that your, your mission for God is to ram that individual down everybody else's throat. I dealt with that with a, with a gentleman in our church, and he left our church because I said, you can't do that to people. You may not treat people that way. And he called me a liberal and walked out. <coughs> I'm a card-carrying Republican, okay? Anyway, listen. Relationships are highly volatile. But as we looked at last week in Proverbs, iron sharpens iron. We are here to build each other up. We are here to encourage each other. We're here to what? glorify God. We're here to love each other and have a sanctuary, a, 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 yeah, a sanctuary where people can come and feel safe and feel loved and be affirmed and be discipled and be encouraged and being built up. But here's the issue. that There are going to be times in our lives when each one of us are imperfect along the way. We're in that process of working out our salvation, so to speak, where we're becoming the vessels of honor that God, that God desires us to be, and we are going to say stupid stuff about each other. The Bible says here that we should go privately to each other and talk, have dialogue, share our hearts. Now, here's the thing. It's going to take you the biggest amount of courage that... If I had to suck up every ounce of courage that I had to overcome my pain, to approach an individual who is a sweet, wonderful individual who said some things to me that they didn't even realize that they said. That's the issue. They didn't even know they hurt me. You hear that? But they hurt me. You and I have to go to those individuals when we are hurt and say, listen, blah, love you. It's going to change who we are as people. The world's going to sit back and say, why didn't you hack their head, head off? We're not Muslim. You know? You know, by the way, go, there's a, I posted this on Facebook today, uh, a, a link to an article from Atlantic Monthly, and it is one of the most in-depth, phenomenal articles about ISIS I've ever read because it talks about their theology. It talks about the fact that it is the Ottoman Empire all over again. It is that they are holding to Muhammad as a prophet and the prophecies that he has out, outlined and the kingdom. They're building his kingdom. And they are a very, very, very unique, pure, focused theologically of Islam. And you can't deal with them the way you deal with any other Muslims because of their theology. And by the way, theology matters. You know, I encourage you, read that article, or really open, and when I'm, 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 I'm like, you know, page seven, scrolling down and realizing, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, they, they've got a mosque in Philadelphia? <laughs> they, that's what it said in the article, it's one of the cities that they have a mosque. They actually named it. I'm like, wow. So this is, this is, this is here. We're working with refugees as a church, indirectly, you know, and we're going to have people that we don't know who they are, where they're coming from, and what they believe. So you need to know what you believe in. You need to speak in your lives. Why am I saying all that? The fact is that it's going to be volatile. Life is volatile. You're going to have relationships with people in a church that will stretch you beyond belief. You're going to have people that are going to say offensive things. What does that matter? God hasn't changed. God has called us to a plan and a purpose. We're supposed to love each other, which means that if someone says something that isn't loving, if someone does an action that isn't godly, we need to deal with it. Because you see, the only way that... Let me go to it real quick. 
I feel obligated if I'm going to randomly quote a verse. Seeing how much our Father loved us, for he calls, his, calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he is... It wasn't the first. I'm in a translation that's different from the one I hear we're going to use. Oh, where are you? Here it is. We know that we know what, and this is in First uh, John three, verse sixteen. We know that the real love is because Jesus gave up His life for us. We also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and our sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother and sister is in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear cheerly children, it's not merely it's not merely saying that we love each other let us show the truth by our actions our actions will show that we belong to the truth so that we may be confident that we stand before God even if we feel guilty God is greater than our feelings and he knows us and it goes on to talk about that the world will only know that we are Christians by how we love one another and the point of the matter is that the only way that gets preserved in perpetuity is if we guard that with the most, the, as the most treasured thing we have and the point I want to leave our mature believers with today, this is your church. This is not Chuck Kiefer's church. I might have started this gob of goo that has evolved, okay? But it is our church. And God says that we are to love one another so that the world may know that he loves them. Which means we, the mature, are to make sure that we maintain that love. So when someone says something that drives you nuts, and we have a few culprits around here on a regular basis who say some pretty wackadoodle things, what are you going to do about it? Now I'm going to open this up to any questions that you might have, because I think this is a good thing. This is a healthy thing for us to talk about as, as mature believers. I mean, no, you can't choke them. I don't advise you to gib slap them, although I've been tempted, you know, I used to say this about youth ministry, the occasional forearm to the throat is good for restoring order. You know, but, you know, but um, what questions you guys might have? Yes, well, um, my new friend. Well, when I was in school, like, there was this girl named Liz, she was like suicidal, and people were like, what would you hurt your dad? Like, fall down and die, you'd be stuff like that. Yeah. And like, I was tempted to like say something like to help her, but the, I didn't want the other people to jump me. Do you go to Strathaven? Yeah. There's, There's a, a problem in Strathaven. Yeah. You know, they have this, if you go into the main, the four-story section of the building, yeah. and you go up those steps, and they have this big, 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 huge mural on the wall, no bullying. Mm -hmm. I stood out front one day with one of my daughter's friends was, uh, who I knew had some suicidal issues. And these three real preppy girls, well, you know, they were wearing the Prada shoes and the bags and all that. I mean, they were dressed to the nines. They were standing around her calling her a fat cow. And she was such a failure because she didn't do the job. She didn't finish the job. She should have taken her life. My own daughter was bullied. When my, my daughter went through some suicidal issues uh, because of the depression, she had depression because of concussions. And she was going through counseling and all that. And she was actually being told by kids at school, take yourself out. You're not worthy of, of, of the air that you breathe. And this is a normal thing. The, folks, if you don't know how kids are treating each other, kids are mean. It is off the chart ugly right now, where kids are literally bullying each other. Uh, there's, a, there's an app. Actually, I did have this part of my message. There's some apps that if your grandkids have on their phones, your kids have on their phones, you need to commandeer their phones and take those apps off. Uh, Yik Yak uh, is a horrific 
All it is is bullying. All it is is name calling. Kids will take a picture of another kid and just spread rumors about that kid. I mean, that is an ungodly app. Snapchat, well, most yeah, of them, yeah, yeah, yeah. Snapchat's an issue because you can, you can take a photo and you can say something and it goes away. But it does stay, it does stay, but it, 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 it's, it's a difficult app. You know, I mean, we live in a social generation where it is easy to propagate, propagate rumors about people and say horrible things. I mean, as a church, we just deal with the fact that someone says smack about us in front of us or behind our back. I mean, that's, that's low level to be gossip that we're dealing with. Well, that's typical church gossip that has always been there, that we have to man up as believers and say, not on my watch, I'm going to deal with this in a loving manner, you know? But it, it, our, our kids in our communities around our churches are getting brutalized by other kids. And you know what? Parents don't care. Go to, how many have you been to a child's soccer game in the past year? Nobody? Okay. Have you noticed the parents on the sidelines? But personally, I really believe, now listen, I used to do business in Germany, and Germans had this policy of if you're going to get a license to drive, it is, as, it is difficult to get a license to drive as it is to fly an airplane. I mean, they put you through classes, and you have to pay fees. And I mean, you know, I really, I really believe this as a pastor. Parenting should be the same way, that we should make people jump through these hoops before they can get pregnant. You know, I'm just saying, because I have gone to soccer games, and I have listened to the smack coming out of parents' mouths. And I'm like, really? And you wonder why your kid over there goes to school and bullies another kid? It's because you're bullying every kid here by your verbal abuse. Now listen, I'm trying to bring this back in to answer, to answer my young friend's question. We have to stand up. Now, because I'm an adult and I'm a clergy, and I was on school property, which is private property, I did not have the authority to go over and interrupt that conversation and chase those girls away. However, what I did do is I talked to my daughter about her friend and we took that girl out for a hamburger and we encouraged her. We still do, by the way. I, I, I got a similar thing. Go, go for it. Um, somebody was asking about her, I was going about. Um, there have been many, many times that someone has made a judgmental statement, uh, especially this happened a lot when the girls were young, yeah. about them with them standing right there to me in a church setting. And the question was, you know, for the child's self-esteem, why don't I say something immediately to that person? First of all, quite often the situation was that I was so incredibly horrified and befuddled that someone would even have the goal to say something like that, that I was just, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. In other situations, it, it's where you realize that no matter what you say to that person, it's only going to get worse because they're in such a judgmental state. And it, some things are just irretrievable. You know, it, it would only escalate. You go back to Matthew situation. 18, you deal with it as you can. If right. the person's obstinate, you deal with it. You bring somebody else with you and confront them. Yeah. Now listen, okay. I want to get more work. Well, 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 so, sorry. Sorry. Because what I'm addressing, I, I don't know your name, I'm sorry. Nasir. Pardon me? Nasir. Okay. Nice okay. Um, well, <coughs> you're, I mean, I think your question is what should I do as yeah. the bystander? Yeah. You right. know? Yeah. And, and, and this is where, you know, for the child or the person, your friend or just, a, you know, someone you may not know them actually. You say what is best for them, yeah. you know, but you also have to balance it out with what would happen in this situation if I stand up for them right now. Yeah. You know, often I would immediately after that person left, I would explain to my child, it isn't that I don't love you and I believe in you and what they said to you was terribly wrong. Yeah. But if I said something to them, they would only get madder or say something worse, and I didn't want them to say anything yeah. worse to you. You know, um, it is, you can't always say something at that moment to the person who's doing the injuring statement. Yeah. 
sometimes it's a matter of wait till they leave and then talk to the person who was hurt yeah. and say, I'm sorry that happened to you. Yeah. They were wrong and I want you to understand that I, I don't think that of you and yeah. I think you're great or I think, you know, and build them up. Yeah. You know, it, you're right, you can't always, it, you would have simply been also bullied yeah. in that situation and yeah. it would have just been, you know, two of you hurt instead of one of you hurt. Yeah. And sometimes, Yes, you can stand up for them and yeah. say, no, what you said was wrong. She's not whatever, yeah. you know. But other times you know you can't. And you just have to really ask the Spirit of God to help you say, what should I do? Yeah. Should I should I say something now or wait a moment? Yeah. You know, um, it just depends. You know, it just depends. Sometimes yeah. and then many times I would take the adult who said the thing yeah. aside af after I told my child to go or they went somewhere else and then I would say something to them. But it just depends one on one on the situation as it happens. And you just have to really follow the spirit of God's leading with that. Yeah. It's uh it's hard. I had when I was a youth pastor I had an elderly gentleman who was a equal opportunity offender. And uh he would be like, we this church used to have pews. And a young pup would walk in the door and his pants were baggy and, and hanging down and you see a little bit of underwear and his ball cap was on sideways. And he'd be five pews away from the kid and he would just start talking out loud about what is with this generation? You know, don't they have any respect for God or country and taking their hat off when they walk in a building and look at that dress. Why isn't he wearing a tie? I mean, okay, in his 80s, when God finally got a hold of his heart, he used to come to youth group and pass out soda and cookies to the kids at snack time and tell them stories and love them. And one day he had an epiphany. I was with, um, oh, what's Bruce's name, the missionary? Or Bruce Porterfield. The three of us were hanging out and talking one day. And Bruce Porterfield starts talking to me and explaining to me how my ministry with young people is very similar to his ministry in the jungles and with the, where the parallels were. And this elderly gentleman was listening to the conversation and you could see the lights go on in the rooms in his mind and his heart where God got a hold of this elderly. And he's like, wow, never thought of it that way. And then he got involved in a positive way in kids' lives. The point I'm going to leave you guys with, this is our church. The things that we hold dear, we need to really hold dear. If the Bible says that by our love for one another, the world will want your Jesus, we need to make sure that that is preserved. If we see someone violating that in a really bad way, you got to pull them aside, give them a talking to, them, put an arm around, take them for coffee, you know, speak into their lives. If you see someone doing harm with they're, 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 they're snipping at people or being negative at people or gossiping about people. Um, deal with it. Don't wait, for a, don't wait for an elder or Gordon or Hare or I to, to deal with it. Deal with it. Deal with it in love. You know, I mean, there, our church has changed in a very, very positive way. Our numbers are different. We have, we've had some people, a lot of you have come because of other people who are no longer here, and now you're connecting to the other people who those other people were once connected to. But we used to have a small group of people in this church who, after the services, would go to the back of the room and talk about everything that was wrong with Obama. And they were very political, and they were very negative. In, in every, you know, the world's coming to an end, we need to lay up canned goods and hide our women in the mountains, you know? And those folks aren't here anymore. God has taken them from us, praise Jesus. You know, and the fact is, we have a much more tolerant congregation who is much more willing. The people that are here are people that know how to love, and people know how to serve, and know how to care about each other. And I really believe God is building something special in our lives. So we need to preserve that culture, and guard it with the most value. It's, it's treasure. This is not found in most churches, by the way. We have something special here. And there's another thing. We have a very encouraging environment. We have young people who don't even know who Jesus is showing up and saying, can I hang out with you? I like what you're doing. And we have the opportunity for the older to teach the younger. 
we have actually in some ways some of the younger teaching the older. I mean, I'm learning a thing or two from some of these guys, you know? And we have this incredible encouraging environment where, which will foster discipleship. It will foster, hey, let's all go out for lunch and talk about this topic, you know? And as a mature believer, you're going to get an opportunity to speak into three or four lives because of truth. We have something special going on here. And listen, backbiting, gossip, uh, sarcasm that we talked about last week, we're always going to have sarcasm. We're from Philadelphia. It, 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 it is the native tongue, you know? We, and by the way, we hate ourselves more than anybody else who hates us. You know, we might not like Boston and New York, but we hate ourselves more. I mean, that's a crazy backhanded way of looking at Philadelphia, but it is so true, you know? And we're not going to change that culture overnight. It might take 80 years of just Jesus being present, you know? But we're not going to change some of these things overnight, but it's managing it. It's having the courage and you realizing that I need to be loyal to my friends here. You know, when I see one of my friends getting stepped on, I need to go out and do what I can to make sure that person's okay. Make sure that person who offended know that they did it in a loving way. I don't mean, listen, when we fight as a couple, and we do occasionally, we're both very, we're both firstborns, we're both highly intelligent, we're both incredibly sarcastic, and we're both hi highly artistic and creative, it just means that there are going to be times that we're going to have points of view as a couple that isn't quite on the same page. But we have rules. Not in front of the kids. We pick our spots. We save it up and say, let's go for coffee. Leave the kids with so-and-so, you know? And we talk it out. It should be that way in the church, too. You don't, if someone's deal, really having pull them aside, be really careful, don't attack them publicly, you know, don't put it on Facebook that so-and-so has a sorry attitude, pray for them, I mean, please don't do that, you know. Uh, as I told you uh, last week, I'll, I'll close with this, we, our words matter and our words are powerful, so I was going to, the other part of the lesson that I didn't give you today, which you're welcome to have, uh, I can send it to you, it talks about the power of the tongue. Gordon, you were here, so you'll appreciate the story. Our open mic class, we, Crispy and I, found a comedian who wanted to come. And we were both saying, hey, we love comedy, especially when it's funny. And I took offense to that statement. I said, with that sarcasm, well, I don't care, it shows your heart. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, okay, well, listen, be careful what you put on Facebook. Really, please? I'd be guilty, okay? So, love one another. Preserve that love. Go out of your way to show love to each other and encourage each other. If, one, if you see somebody's down, build them up. That will combat gossip every single time. And when you see somebody being hurt or someone says some mean things, and again, the culprits aren't here this morning. Love them. They've been dealt with. Even if, no, I know where they are. Um, loving our younger folks. The, the biggest thing they need for many of the younger folks in our church is they need moms and dads because they never had moms and dads. No one's ever told them what right, right is. You know? It's where a few mature believers come in. You know? To love on the younger. Be moms and dads. Half of my job as a pastor is being a dad. That's why I have so many young guys that we're speaking into, you know. Well, why don't we pray? And um, Jason, could you just play a little something? Because what I, just without singing, like, uh, uh, play whatever you're going to play, but don't sing it just yet. Give people a time. Um, I, I, I want, I'm, go, I'm just going to pray, but I want to have an attitude of prayer this morning, uh, where as he's playing the song, through a couple times. Be honest with God. Talk to him about where you're at. Allow the Spirit of God to speak to you about the circumstances that you could have spoken into or should speak into in people's lives. Allow the Spirit of God to show you this morning, if I have said something, let me go make that right with that individual. Let's just take a little time with our own hearts 
do some housekeeping this morning spiritually. Just allow the Spirit of God to just linger and minister to our hearts. And then Jason, as the Spirit leads, go into the song. Okay? Father, this morning we just pray, asking you to... <sighs> Gossip's a horrible thing. It touches our lives in so many horrible ways. Help us not to be guilty of it. Help us, be, help, us, help us to be aware of these problems. And if we're causing them, help us to be aware of what we're doing and how to stop it. Also, Father, help us to preserve the spirit of love that we're, we're to have, the spirit of unity, that, Lord, that we would minister to one another, love on one another, speak to one another, and encourage one another. That, Lord, that you would foster something special in this place. That, Lord, that may we practice Matthew 18 when, when necessary. And may our circumstances and our relationships not even have to come to that. That we can preemptively just love on people and minister to people. Dwell with us now, Father, as we, as we spend this short time in prayer just to minister to our hearts in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.